All right, I'll go ahead and get started. So welcome back, everybody. Um, this is the Caregiver Coalition of Northeast Florida's virtual caregiver conference, How Full Is Your Cup? Uh, if you're just tuning in, we're dedicating this whole time this morning to talking about self-care and combating stress and really just filling our cup when we're running on empty. So my name is Candace Crescenson. I am the coordinator for the coalition. Um, and I'm super happy to be here. And I'm joined by Miss Margaret Johnston. So welcome, Miss Margaret. Thank you. Really quickly, before we get started, um, I want to share a short message from a couple of our 2021 sponsors. How's everybody doing? Hey, guys. Hi. It's time to lean on each other. All of you guys, so much great support. And laugh with each other. <laughs> Cheers. Let's do it together with caregiving chats and more. Come find us at aarp.org slash near you. My wife, I call her a drill sergeant. She gave me the inspiration to, to build myself up. I need to go on Dallas's Florida Blues. They gave my wife good information, what I ate, how she cooked, and everything. In fact, if I go to the store and buy something today, she'll get in the arena and say, you can't have this. And that's why I think I'm where I'm at today. All right, we have some generous and, and dedicated sponsors this year. Our 2021 gold sponsors, Florida Blue, Baptist Agewell Center for Senior Health and Community Hospice and Palliative Care, and our renewing silver sponsor, AARP. So thank you so much to our sponsors for helping us make these workshops and, and making this happen. Thanks, everybody. Very quick items. Um, the session is being recorded. So we're gonna be posting it to our website and our YouTube channel. I will share that with everybody attending next week. Um, and for that reason, all microphones and cameras, except for those of the speakers are turned off and that's just to minimize distractions throughout the workshop. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can type those into the chat box and I'll make sure that we go over them. And then at the end of the session, I'm gonna pull up a quick poll and that's just for you to give us some feedback on what you liked and what you didn't like. and that'll help us improve these sessions in the future. And then lastly, um, in case we run into any technical difficulties, please be patient. We're gonna try and resolve them as quickly as possible. So with that, I want to introduce Ms. Margaret Johnston. Uh, she's here with us this morning to talk about how to succeed as a caregiver without burning out. Ms. Margaret participates in community activism and leadership with a focus on environmental and social justice issues as they intersect for women locally and internationally. And she currently serves as the president of Zonta of Jacksonville, an award-winning club providing hands-on assistance, advocacy, and funding to strengthen women's lives in Northeast Florida. Uh, Ms. Margaret presents mental health topics publicly in both dialectic and experiential forms with smarts and heart. So we are happy to have you here, Ms. Margaret. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming to this. I'm glad that everyone's taking time to do some self-care by experiencing this workshop. That first speaker was awesome, left me with nothing to say. No, really. Um, what we're gonna do this morning with me is we're gonna talk about establishing boundaries for ourselves, strength from humbleness and sustainable, self-healing. So we're going to start with boundaries. Um, there's, if there's any CNAs or professionals working um, in the field that are on this um, Zoom, it, this will probably be something you're familiar with. With others who are doing home care for their loved ones, if you ever move into a space where you buy or, or pay for help, um, then this is the kinds of things that you can expect. There, um, people will lose licenses if they don't follow these kinds of things. So there's a lot of details. Um, there's a, going to be a slide um, sent out with the recordings that has the list of the um, Florida statutes it's, I have both the CNA and the nursing ones. I'm not gonna do all the details on those, but for things that you would want to watch for, both yourself if you're a professional or to watch your professional to have going on is um, 
inaccurate recording is a, this is the unprofessional conduct that includes inaccurate recording. So that would be something that their, their supervisor would notice more than something a family member would notice. Misappropriation of drugs, supplies, or equipment. Leaving an assignment without advising their supervisor. Stealing from a patient. Violating the integrity of a medication administration system or technology system, information technology system. Falsifying or altering a patient record or progress notes. Violating confidentiality of information or knowledge concerning a client or a patient. Discriminating in any manner protected by law. Engaging in fraud, misrepresentation, deceit. Impersonating another licensed practitioner by level of licensure. Um, providing correct or false information to the employer. Practicing beyond the scope of the license. So a CNA has to have special training to administer medicine or the nurses have to be the ones who administer medicine. Of course, hospitals and so forth um, teach family members how to do certain things. Um, but just be aware of what your CNA can do as opposed to what a nurse would have to come in and do. And your um, professionals, your doctor and so forth would be able to help you know what's, who can do what, what if the specialized care for your loved one. Um, using any force against a patient, striking a patient, throwing objects at a patient, all these are things that are horrible and wouldn't, we wouldn't want to have happen, but apparently they do occasionally to have to be named. Any kind of abuse or threatening or foul language in front of a patient or directed at the patient. Accepting a gift from the patient is not allowed and um, knowingly obtaining or using or attempting to obtain the use of a patient's property or money temporarily or permanently deprive a patient of the use. So um, those are all things you wanna make sure are not happening in any relationship with professionals um, in the caregiving arena. Also the one that we don't wanna to have to talk about but also has to be talked about is any kind of sexual misconduct. The, the patients are always vulnerable and that requires everyone to be watchful, make sure that the patient knows that they can self-advocate at any moment with you, the family member, about anything, any of the above kinds of things that might be going on that they're aware of. It's not ever um, complaining. So why is this part of self-care? It is because boundaries set limits and provide structure and thereby prevent harm to the patients, it prevents harm to the professional, and it pre prevents harm to the family. And all of that is a self-care attitude. Um, it creates an atmosphere of safety and allows the relationship to develop between the CNA or the nurse or the family member even further um, to, so the patient will always feel comfortable and safe. And that's so important for both the patient and the caregiver to have that feeling of safety and comfortableness, uh, but not, you know, the boundary thing is not too comfortable, right? We don't want to um, do so much for the patient that they feel helpless because we want to always make sure that the patient um, has, um, has been given the space to do the things that they can do and to not take away from that. Um, it's kind of, to me, it's always about not stealing their agency. Um, if they can put their own shoes on, then let them, even if it takes 10 minutes instead of three. Um, don't, don't, you know, do things that would stop them from being able to practice their um, own agency over their life. Um, the, the boundaries, again, they're, they're, it's like the crucible in which we, uh, the caregiving exists and they set up an atmosphere for the mutual respect and the therapeutic purpose of the caregiving. And even though um, there's a lot of us here being family members that take care of our own family, it's still important to keep the boundaries and um, not to formalize the relationship necessarily, but to keep the boundaries 
and know that we stop at the edge of our skin. And when we're a hands-on caregiver, we have to be so aware of um, making sure that person feels safe and has their own integrity going on all the time. So um, it, it, this helps bring a, equilibrium and equality into the into the relationship it creates mutual respect and that's always a self-care sort of thing because what as you respect them and they respect you it feels so much better so um some of the examples of safeguarding our mental and emotional equilibrium are not servicing a client when we're ill to not bring them anything. I think this last year really brought that to the forefront. Um, a caregiver obviously couldn't go into the home of a patient um, when the caregiver themselves is sick. Um, when we're in grief, if we're in grief, we're not gonna be fully there. It might be that we need to take some days off, maybe more than three that, you know, that we might get paid for, but to be off, we might need some more time than that. And um, working while we're in deep grief, we might see it as I've got to be strong and I've got to do, hopefully you have some financial leeway to take enough time so that you can be present for the patient, protects both you and the patient to be able to pay attention and not be so over-involved in yourself in a moment. Um, another way of safeguarding is knowing and staying within your own limits, um, not pushing yourself, not lifting without um, the help of equipment or another person to not um, do any task that is beyond your own limits for the safety of both yourself and the patient. Um, sticking to time schedules, um, especially if you're a professional, arriving on time, but also leaving on time. Um, obviously, sometimes you're waiting for the next shift to come in, depending on the care level that that person is under. They might be 24 hours a day. Somebody may have been caught in traffic. This is Jacksonville, right? And um, so watching your time and making sure that the other person that relieves you from your shift, you know, understands boundaries and doesn't take advantage of you being the nice person that stays. That's that's not okay either. So um, creating some time to research and take notes um, on care techniques, learning new equipment if the family buys any, um, the getting the proper training, and consulting with any peers or supervisors that you have as a professional, and then as a family member, consulting with the care the um, uh, care givers that are professionals, the doctors, nurses, or any other contacts you have that would be helpful. Don't forget to keep asking questions when issues come up. Don't ever feel like you have to be the one who knows everything. That's more pressure than anybody has to go through. Um, so talk to me if you want to in the chatting about any um, thing that came up there. You know, how do you safeguard um, your mental health and your emotional equilibrium when you're in a caregiving exam um, role. This type when you want to, I'm gonna go on with the presentation just so, but you can react to this in any time during, in the chat. Um, we would also like to think about internal um, pressures on boundaries. Sometimes we uh, feel like we need to help whoever asks for help in any way that they need it done. And sometimes that's not really the right thing for either you or them. Um, also, we may need more income and that might drive us to come back to work too early, either after an illness or after a time of grief or work too many jobs or um, work a job and go home and care for them, you know, the other 16 hours of the day without getting more help from the outside. Because we also, as a caregiver, we also can get into that hero ro role and uh, think we're the only one who can help, but there's a whole plethora of professionals out there who can help. Um, don't price below the cost of the service. If you're a, a CNA independent, um, uh, you know, self-employed, 
make sure that you get enough money to be able to live your life as well. Don't, don't, uh, I, we all feel compassion for families, but we also have to, you know, be able to put food on the table. You know, the whole reason we work in the first place is to support ourselves. And so when, when it's a family member to a family member, of course the cost doesn't come into it, but there's still gonna be cost on your time and energy and do watch that you don't overdo because you won't be able to be there the next day or the next period if we if if we let ourselves push into that place that is more than we can really do. So when it's the professional, the external pressures are working more hours than contracted. People will ask you to work off the clock. That is not okay. Do some pushback. Um, billing hours not allowable. Um, so we, you know, sometimes the, the um, when, when we're there, they don't want us to say that we work that extra half hour because we're waiting for our shift relief to get there. But again, that's not fair to you. Um, there's unethical organizational administrative pressure at times. Um, that is, that's no, everybody has a boss. Even if they're the owner of the company, there's regulatory places you can go. And um, so be careful of the, the demands of both your employer, if you're a professional, and the patient. Um, part of the boundaries is safeguards both of us. So the, con the conversations can be difficult when you're talking to a patient. If they want you to do this and that, on your way home, will you deposit this check? That may or may not be a boundary crossing, but it puts you in a danger zone. What if something happens and the check doesn't hit their bank account? then you're in danger. So always be careful when you're professional. Um, if there is no alternative, then it may be something needs to be written down or talk to your supervisor about what you can or can't do for this person in that way. Um, so what happens when the boundaries have slipped? What if we get in a habit of doing something when uh, that we probably shouldn't have gotten to. Um, so habits of doing as least as possible for, um, form, you know, like it, we might, um, we're supposed to do these 10 steps for a procedure, but that one part just doesn't really seem important. And so we do one less step that creates carelessness and it will increase and get into other parts of your care routine. So we have to remember to be precise in uh, covering all the steps of doing something like moving a person on a Hoya or whatever, the, the bathing steps, making sure all of that body gets cleaned um, so that we don't move into a space where on those days that we're tired that we don't take care of that person completely. Um, have a trusted supervisor if you can a, or a counselor offsite um, who will respect you and we'll call you out on any behavior that you are moving into that's not good for you. So not call out in a bad, ugly way, but of course to help you manage yourself so that you can stay as professional as possible. Address any slippage with the client. Um, if they um, have gotten you to do certain things for them that you know really didn't feel comfortable the first time and still don't feel comfortable for whatever reason, whatever those things could be, address it with the client. This is a hard conversation again, but always you can couch it in the way of this isn't healthy for me or for you, or this is not a place I should have gone to and it's been pointed out to me and I need to step back from that. Just however you want to do it. But, um, and if it's your relative, you know, just let them know. It's, you, you know that relationship in particular on how to approach them. Um, because what you don't want to do, especially with uh, relatives is sometimes people badger. They're, they're ill, they don't feel good, they get cranky, and that's with everybody. But you don't want to let that kind of thing go on from them. And then the same for you, you get tired and cranky and you don't wanna have this habit of any kind of, um, any kind of attitude coming out of you or tone that will make them feel bad about getting care from you. So there's, um, there's some strengths from humbleness. 
um, helping professionals can induce um, a, a savior or a martyr complex. It's really hard when you're the only one in the family who's caring for the relative and there's all these other people available, but they won't pick up the slack. That is hard. But that when we do that to make it feel a little better, we start feeling like, well, of course we're the only one because we're the best and we're gonna save that person. Um, so to avoid that, remind yourself and the client or the relative who the expert is on the client, their needs and their desires. Okay, so the expert always is the client or the, or the relative about their own needs and express it verbally. Make sure you let them know, you know what's best here or you know what you want to eat today. And when they might choose something that's not good for themselves, remind them, okay, you always have choices, but it's A and B, it's not A through Z, you know? So make sure that they know they have agency, but perhaps in a limited setting. Um, remind yourself and the client that the client is neither helpless nor competent without you. They lived their life or they might be a child, but they're still learning and that they can do things. Uh, remind yourself that you're replaceable when it's a family member and unpaid, maybe you're not replaceable to that extent. But if something happened, somebody would come and take care of the relative. So in, the, in that sense, everyone is replaceable. And remind yourself it's not your job to assist the client into not needing. It is your job to assist the client into not needing you if that's possible for that particular client. So when someone's doing a recovery but needs um, care as they move through their physical therapy or occupational therapy period, but until they get to that place of competency, um, they need help. Just remember that that they need to, um, you need to lose them as a client eventually. So you help support them. Um, if they're totally incapacitated, one of the comments over here, then of course um, you, you're going to follow the protocols with that patient. If you know they don't have as much agency, obviously, if they're able to listen and communicate, then give them as many choices as possible. When do you want your bath? When do you want to eat? Those kinds of things. Um, with dementia, that's a whole different um, uh, ball game. And always rely on any professionals you can and resources you can to help you through that because dementia is so different for each person depending on what part of the brain is affected by the dementia itself. And there's research out there and obviously you're busy, but if you have time to get with anyone about that, I'm not an expert on that, but I know there's it's huge as far as both in numbers and in possibilities. And, and so that's something, you, that's a self-care thing to find out what you can, about how do you take care of people with that. Um, remind yourself that you're doing that, doing for someone what they can do for themselves is a form of stealing their agency. Uh, so this altered mindset allows you freedom to not be responsible for the other person's circumstance, decisions, outcomes, or life. And it sets you free and it sets them free to control what they can about themselves. So when it's the real tough cases of total incapacitation, you know, in what manner is it? Is that mind inca incapacitation or is it body? Um, it, when it's dementia, it's mind, but it's not body. And so they still have the freedom to move and be as much as they can in their own lives. So one of the biggest self-care things to, to remember is to release yourself from the fragility of perfectionism. Um, perfectionism is the compulsive need to achieve and accomplish one's goals with no allowance for falling short of one's goals. And that means also <clears throat> goals for the patient. They may not be up to that five minute walk today or that half hour walk, whatever is their level is. Um, they may not be ready to do whatever the task is but it doesn't have to happen in that five minutes if they don't want it to. And for yourself, the bed does not have to be, you know, have a coin flip bounce if you drop it on it. Um, make sure everything, good enough is good enough. If it wasn't, we wouldn't say good enough. That doesn't mean get sloppy. That's not a, a habit you wanna get into, 
but nothing has to be perfect. Okay, so find support with other professionals. Um, avoid any professional bullies that you might run into that, that happens in the workplace as far as supervisors and even coworkers. Or be careful about this, the boards out there for the CNAs or other caregivers <clears throat> because people will, as on any social media, beat each other up verbally. We, you don't need that. You don't have time for that. That's not a self-care thing to indulge in listening to others put each other down. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so um, the one of the things that really helps us with self-care is to jump out of self-created echo chambers. Don't always use yourself as your own reference. Again, connect with others who either do this or um, or other family members that are whether they're physically they're helping. Make sure you connect with them and bounce ideas off of them if they're available. And then the paid people, the CNAs and nurses, um, make sure that you connect with the family members of the, of the person you're caring for and be sure that what you're doing and what the uh, patient has um, indicated they want done, it's gonna work with, for everybody. And that's kind of hard to do because always everybody has their own opinion, keeping in mind that the opinion of the person being cared for is the priority, if at all possible. Uh, I know with dementia patients that can be wrong, <laughs> but um, when it's okay, you know, just let them let them be the one that's in charge always. <clears throat> uh, it's going to really save your um, friendships and your partnerships or marriages if you do not bring this home every day. And so how do you not take, how do you take care of yourself and carry all of this burden that is in you? If you're a CNA and you're on a two hour frequency and that's, what is that like? Maybe three to four people a day, depending on how long your shift day is, um, to carry that every day with you and not speak to anyone. That's not going to work. We all have the story we need to tell and so forth. But if we go home and every day we review our whole day with our partner or we um, every time our friends call, we tell them all about the stuff that went on that day or the last week and all the negativity, then we're going to burn them out because also that becomes our only conversation and we don't have time to get away from it because that's all we're thinking about verbalizing. So what is very helpful is if you have the means is to get a counselor or someone who can be your sounding board. And um, that that is sometimes a paid relationship, sometimes not. It all depends on what you and the other person want to arrange or can arrange. So in that professional relationship, you never, um, you're not there to dazzle them with how good you are or to elicit a pity party. What you're there for is to get feedback and for you to take time to find your own way and to know that you have the wisdom to find your own way and they can give guided questions. And it, like I said, it saves you from having to do that with non-professionals and um, saves those relationships. Um, so there's, um, there's a poem that helps us know if we're doing the right thing in our lives, which obviously is self-care when we are. And I wanna read that to you. It's called The Seed of the Soul by Gary Zukav. When the deepest part of you becomes engaged in what you are doing, when your activities and actions become gratifying and purposeful. When you do, when what you do serves both yourself and others. When you do not tire within, but seek the sweet satisfaction of your life and of your work, you are doing what you are meant to do. I hope that each of you have this in your life in both the care of a relative and the care of a, uh, a patient or in any other activity in your life to know that what you're doing is feeding you and not taking from you only. So um, there are um, some strategies for self-care. Um, 
on the, I think on this same slide. And um, one of the things I want to do here was have you list some of the self-care. You don't have to list it in the comments, but you can if you feel like it. Just like maybe write down 10 things that are holistic self-care strategies. I mean, we heard a bunch before, but what are you actually, what are you actually doing for yourself? Um, and because bringing it to um, the foreground by writing them down reminds you to do them. Okay, so 10 is maybe a lot. So um, instead of me speaking the whole time, I don't know, can we, um, do um, something where people are unmuted and they could say a few things to each other and just don't repeat what someone else has already said. Kendi? Sure. Yeah, we could do something like that. Um, if you want to put it in the chat or if you would like to unmute yourself and share something that you do for self-care. Good morning. I'm Tangela Brown. Hey, Tangela. Hi, Tangela. Hi. And one of the things that I do for self-care is journaling. And I exercise. But I find journaling helps me out a great deal because I'm able to write down my thoughts, write down my goals, and then always write something positive and some affirmations. So like down the road, a couple of weeks later on, I'll go back and I'll look and I'll look and I'll say, ooh, look how far you've come. So it's a way of showing gratitude for the day and also just showing just how resilient I am from that day that I wrote from two weeks and looking back and saying, I made it through that. So that's my way of self-caring and definitely exercise is very good for me. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, exercise. Um, even though we come home tired, if we take a minute and then go do some kind of exercise, um, it will, it tends to re-energize us even though we're already tired. It kind of lifts the tired that we came in with and moves us into a different place, um, releases a lot of uh, brain chemicals that are good for us. And then of course that journaling, thank you for sharing that. And um, especially if you uh, aren't in a position to buy a counselor, right? Writing down those negative things that happened and then letting them go, perhaps looking at them intentionally and saying, I'm letting you go. I wasn't, I made a mistake there, but I am okay and the patient is okay. And um, now I know not to move in that way or do that action or something. But other, you know, to, to resolve that with self-compassion around any mistake. And again, like you said, Tangela, to, um, to um, congratulate yourself on the good points each day too and the, and the uh, wonderful things that can happen, those good moments between the caregiver and the um, and the patient. Margaret, we have um, some other ideas here in the chat. And I'd like to quickly go off of that journaling. You know, something that I do um, as a form of self-care is I schedule a little bit of time out every day for what I call a free write. It's like a brain dump. We're even just taking five minutes just to write without hardly even thinking about it just write everything that's on my mind in that moment. You know, whether it's something I went through that day or something bothering me from weeks ago, you know, to get it all off of my brain and write it down. And then you're able to look back and see if there are any patterns or if, you know, you know how best to really take care of yourself and how you're handling different moments. So that's something I do. We have some good suggestions in the chat too with working in the yard and, and caring for pets, you know, walking the dog and going for a walk in the neighborhood while listening to music or listening to an audiobook. So taking that time to yourself to take care of your body too. Right. Um, there's um, some more thoughts on that are, um, 
that self-compassion is the wellspring. Why do we bother with it? It's the wellspring of emotional resilience and motivation and personal growth and better interpersonal relationships and physical health. If we're not being self-compassionate, then these areas all suffer. I see some more um, comment. It says a vacation twice a year and regular prayer and devotion. And they eat lunch with close friends regularly, gardening. Facebook gets, Facebook get in touch with families and friends all over the world. So using Facebook and social media in a positive way, um, we talked, they talked about that in the first one. We have to always be careful with social media to not get into those negative spaces, but staying connected to our family and friends is, is especially last year, went into the electronic realm quite often. Um, so those are all great. The um, self-compassion also protects us against depression and stress and anxiety because we have a buildup of the gratitude and the um, self-care um, that we've done. And anxiety, I say that anxiety is trying to turn the corner before we've walked down the street. And self-compassion protects us from trying to live in the future when it's impossible. We all make plans, but then things like the COVID happens and we all sit down at the house as much as possible. So we don't ever know what's coming and it could be good things. But it's, we always worry about the bad things, and that's where the anxiety comes in. And self-compassion self protects us against trying to be in, ahead of ourselves um, more than is necessary as far as plans go. Um, self-compassion has three components in particular. Self-kindness, the physical, food, and exercise. You can't outrun your plate. So um, don't think that exercise is the only key to physical health. We do have to eat right. Um, mood improvement um, happens with self-kindness. Um, sustained movement for um, six weeks will give you endorphin, dopamine, and serotonin relief into your brain. Um, it, it exercises the channels for those chemicals to flood your brain in the proper way, and it helps you um, the sustained movement creates good patterns, not just for your body, but in particular for your brain. And, and what, what is endorphin for? It is a pain mitigator. Dopamine is, creates um, pleasure at activities that, um, our, that our body might need that aren't particularly pleasurable, like drinking water. Why do we think it's pleasurable? Because our brain says so. Hopefully it doesn't have a taste. So why do you want to drink water? Because your body needs it. But your brain says, this is good. Let's do this again. Um, serotonin is a uh, mood regulator. It doesn't mean we're not depressed and not anxious. We just don't go off the charts in either direction when we have good serotonin processing in our brain. Um, recognition of our common humanity is part of the component of self-compassion. So um, the brain chemical involved in that is oxytocin. It's the human bonding hormone. It creates feelings of calm and trust, generosity and interconnectedness, warmth and self-compassion. So it's kind of a, a loop of self-compassion creates self-compassion. So when we do the, when we make those connections both with our patient with our family member, with our friends, and um, all the connections that we have in our life, the ones that are um, both deep and wide, and also the ones that are just the, the lady at the window every time you do the drive-through, if it's the same person all the time, that's still a connection. Our brain is, our brain only needs about two best friend type connections. But um, it, I mean, um, um, not just connection, but bondings. And we, but the connections, it loves, it loves connections. And the connections only, only needs to be eye contact. Connections, the quality does not matter. It's the bonding is when the quality does matter. And it actually extends our lives to have deep connect, um, 
bondings with one to two people. You can have more, but for the deep ones, you only need up to about two to, as a need level. But the connection level of um, just superficial connection, that's fine. It's, it's about not being lonely. It's about being reminded that there's other people in the world, which again was hard last year, right? So um, one of the other things about recognition of common humanity is amplifying the positive, brag, tell someone, tell everybody what you did that was good, what you accomplished this year, that, that you met a goal, anything, use social media, create a, a, a praise posse, you know, people, a small group of people who you trust and they um, trust you and you share each other's positivities and accomplishments throughout uh, the year or whatever. There's face group, uh, Facebook groups for that. There's one for women in particular called FIMPS and they have a Brag Friday um, on Facebook. The other thing to do if you're not into the Facebook stuff is to write it down as has been mentioned, the journaling and to verbally compliment yourself. Don't just do it and you had a good job, you know, say it out loud to yourself at times. Uh, look in the mirror in the morning and tell yourself this positive things, um, some of those positive statements that were used in the first um, presentation. Um, and the gratitude journal was already mentioned in that first presentation too. Or you can do something to mark the occasion. Um, I didn't march when I graduated with my undergraduate degree and I wish I had. So I did march on my master's degree. So it's that kind of a thing. Um, it doesn't have to be huge, but mark it in some way, whatever feels the best for you. So the other, the third component with that in the um, self-compassion is mindfulness, which we talked about a lot um, in the first time. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out is life is difficult. It is this, this kind of being a um, caretaker for someone professionally or volunteer is very hard. And uh, as Scott Peck says, the opening sentence of the road less traveled is life is not fair. How did this happen to my loved one? Why am I the one that has to be the, the caretaker? Why did I get assigned this role? Um, those why questions are always almost in any setting are impossible to answer. So we need to move on to what's important now because this is the reality now. How do I get more help or how do I deal with what is? Um, you can't be self-compassion if you don't realize that you're suffering. So recognizing that something's going on in your life is hard and getting help with that in any way possible will help you be both self-compassion in that action and help you be self-compassionate um, overall. And discerning um, between pain and judgment and permanent and temporary and desire and need. And where do those play in your life? Um, use mindfulness to acknowledge your feelings, becoming responsible for your own emotion frees us up in two ways. This is a, a big concept of um, in self-compassion. When we stop thinking that he or she made me sad, angry, shamed, or happy, when we say the sentence, he makes me happy, or he made me angry, we're giving up our agency. And we, we, when we know that, we start realizing that we are accepting our reactions as someone else's fault. And we start regaining our personal power of learning to pause and um, own how we react to our fast, countless thoughts with their tagging emotions. How are we gonna to react to our own thoughts and feelings? Um, that's when we create humanness and self-compassion, when we take just that half breath to wait before we, before we react. Um, someone else always sends a stimulus or your environment does, and we as humans have the power to control our reactions to our own thoughts and feelings. Um, that's when you actually obtain freedom in the world is making decisions instead of being buffeted about by others or environmental factors. So when we do practice the pause and decision um, 
process. We are no longer subject to the whims of others. We also learn the, um, that we are no longer responsible for other people's reactions to their own thoughts and feelings and how to decide to react to them. So when, when other people, you do your benign work of whatever, but they're having a bad day or they have extra pain and they yell or whatever happens or they get fussy, remember that they're responsible for their feelings of happiness or sadness or irritation, the same as you are. And it, one, it takes, it takes a huge load off of you that you're not being paid to make them happy. You are being paid to take care of them. Or when it is your family member, that you are responsible to take care of them, but they are responsible for their feelings. I know with dementia patients, that's going to be really difficult, um, but you still have to take that step back. Um, so not being responsible for others doesn't mean to be any kind of mean to them because people will react and there will be consequences. So always be as ethical in your emotional responses as you can be. So um, I think it got brought up a little early, the um, self-care inventory. So <clears throat> that blue sheet there, that's some um, ideas on some self-care that, um, that you may or may not have thought of already or had the, the time or the means to do. But I'd like you to look it over and think about which ideas appeal to you and um, or which ones you've already planned in your life and then which ones um, you think you might want to try to incorporate. So when we have lists like that, I want you to be cautious. <clears throat> I don't want you to be overwhelmed by the shoulds. You know, don't shame yourself that you don't already journal and exercise and meditate and all these things that um, are good for you. But there are still only 24 hours in a day, no matter what um, we say would be good for you to do. It can only be good for you if you have the time and energy to do it. So alternately, don't go all type A personality on yourself and plan to tick off every single one of them. And, and within some kind of really short time frame, that's that's not self-care either. So um, both of those paths of shoulds and regrets and also pushing yourself leads to self-violence. And that is the opposite of self-care. So both in action and in word, like this, the, there's self-violence and putting yourself down uh, when things aren't perfect and don't turn out exactly as you planned. And also, um, just the not self-care, that, that kind of um, the, the, the negative space of not taking care of yourself is also self-violence. But you have to create balance in your own life about yourself, both as a professional. Take those days off then you're allowed to or can afford to. Make sure as a family volunteer that you reach out for respite care and that there's there are resources um, in communities for people to be able to take some days off when needed and take them and take care of yourself so that you can come back when you come back and fully be there. So I'd like to thank you for this time together. And I could see there's tons of beautiful comments on the other side that I couldn't read while I was talking and trying to focus on getting my words to you. Thank you so much, Margaret. I'd like to read, we had a few questions a little bit earlier on um, in the presentation. And I know the first part of your presentation was talking about being, um, a lot about being a professional caregiver and those boundaries. And I think there's a lot of insight there into, for family caregivers too, who hire um, a professional caregiver to help them care for their loved one. And so we had a few questions. Um, I'm scrolling up for them now. Um, we had a question about gifts and our, our birthday and Christmas gifts or really any kind of gifts. Um, should there be a boundary there as a family caregiver and giving those to a professional caregiver? Are there expectations there and, you know, whether or not a caregiver or a professional caregiver is able to take those kinds of gifts? Okay, so if you're working for an agency, then check with your agency. 
I, th I know in my profession, which is mental health care, um, there's a dollar limitation. Also, you want to always establish um, a boundary with that with the person. Like, I just don't accept gifts. You know, if it's a if it's a child and it's a token gift or do you want this picture that I just drew? Yes, you know, consider their feelings. Some cultures like um, Oriental cultures, and sorry for the word because it's like, you know, half the world, but there are some cultures in particular that to not take the gift is highly insulting and they will leave your, they will leave that therapeutic relationship. So you have to be a little bit culturally attuned. Um, so let's say just in kind of in general in the majority culture here, um, as a gift giver, like you're the family person and you want to re reward or um, recognize that person on their birthday or Christmas or whatever, again, they have to check with their agency. But if, it's, if they're self-employed, that's between you and them to a certain extent. Don't create um, so much generosity that people start expecting it. We always have to be careful of that because we all, if you give me 10 gifts, I want all 10 every year, right? No, we have to be really careful with that um, so that you don't put them in a place of uncomfortableness as well. Um, especially if they work for an agency, ask them first, hey, am I allowed to, you know, you can probably always give a card without slipping money into it. You can always probably give them a card, but um, I would, if they're in an agency, ask them, are you allowed to accept gifts? Can we give you a birthday gift? Um, yeah. And with that one, we had a question. She said, when I request my mother-in-law's caregiver to take her somewhere that costs money, for example, the Alhambra dinner theater, I pay for the caregiver's ticket as well. Is that a concern? No, it's not because you've asked her to do a costly thing. You know, if it's because like when they run errands for the family, then their mileage should be, um, Re reimburse their, their gasoline costs should be reimbursed as well. And you guys can decide if that's like a monthly thing, if they always are the one that does running to this place, that place. And you can do it at the federal reimbursement level, or you can just pay for it, you know, but I, I would recommend just paying for, you know, add up the miles that you know that they did for you monthly or something and give them an extra check for that. You know, Margaret, there was something that you said that really stuck out with me and I wrote it down. And you had said to be careful about getting stuck in an echo chamber. And I think that's so important, both as a, a family caregiver and a professional caregiver, um, when you're in a situation and, you know, you feel like you don't have anyone to ask advice or, you know, mom or dad is acting really difficult and you don't know how to respond to the behavior that's, you know, that's when it's really important to reach out. That's what support groups are really great for. You're surrounded by, by people who are going through very similar situations and you have the opportunity to bounce off ideas and say, well, this worked for me, you know, it, it, it might not work for you and just get different ideas about how to handle these, these difficult situations. Um, and then also to gain a little bit more information about what, your loved one might be going through if they're, if they have, you know, a certain disease, if they're recovering from a stroke, if they have dementia, there are some nuances to those that, you know, you might not be aware of until you're faced with it. So right. being able to have people, whether it's, you know, a support group or a professional or having a good relationship with your loved one's physician, being able to reach out and say, look, I'm, I don't really know how to handle this. You know, what should I expect? What should, what are the next steps to take in order to do this? So I thought that was really, I thought that was really great, getting stuck in an echo chamber. And one of the other things that goes with that is um, both not doing this and, and uh, bringing it forward when someone else does it is to not answer any questions with, I understand exactly what you're going through, <laughs> or I understand you exactly, you're feeling or whatever, because we don't. Be this is part of being a caregiver, both for yourself and for anyone else, is to be humble. No one understands exactly what I'm feeling because only I live my life, even if it's my sister <laughs> saying that, you know, it's like, nope. So, especially in groups like online groups, when they start with, I understand exactly, it's, it's, a, it's a, a cultural phrase. So, 
you know, just the pushback would be gentle, like, you know, no, only I can understand exactly what I feel, but I can tell you are being compassionate with me. What, however you want to say that, but also for yourself, just make sure that you don't use those words on other people. And it will actually enhance the connection to not assume you understand exactly how they are. And with your patient, you know, if they hurt their ankle that day and you have done that 10 times or something, I know exactly how you feel. That's really painful. Just start with that's really painful. I bet that hurts a lot. Mm -hmm. That's some great advice. There's some more comments in the chat um, about sharing gifts. Um, I will say that with the documents that we shared with the, the self-care inventory and the poem, we will be sharing those. Um, like we had said, we're gonna be sharing those in an email probably next week once we send out the recording for this session. So you'll be, you'll be able to have those on hand with you. And Margaret, there um, are questions about um, everything that you've been sharing, do you have this information anywhere? Do you have a book? Do you have a, a blog? You know, where can, where can those with us today um, learn more from you? That is so sweet. Um, wow. I don't, I mean, what I could do, so you have my references, is I could go ahead and give permission to share this, the the scripting that I had written for myself so that I didn't lose my place too much or too often. Um, so I could do that. Within it are my references. Um, so that could help and you could find where I kind of found this information. Um, but I didn't use just one book or something. I wanted to comment on the person who drums. How beautiful. And um, I hope that there, I don't know if you drum solo or if you have a drum circle group. I know there's drum circle groups in Jacksonville, if that's where you are, if everybody's from here. There's a wonderful one in Gainesville, if you're down in that area. That's the one I actually go to sometimes. Um, but you might be able to find wherever it is that you are, you might be able to find the, a group in your area on the internet. Um, and there are, um, I don't I'm so enthusiastic about drumming. There are drumming um, videos. And so, and anything can be a drum. Remember your two-year-old, all you'd have to do is break a pan out of the, uh, out of the pan drawer, right? Get a <laughs> wooden stick and go at it. Um, so there's, there, and there's something to be said for that because it can be um, really energetic and you just get those feelings out physically, especially um, men need to use their body to get their feelings out. So it's interesting that it was um, a guy that wrote that and, um, you know, just beat the heck out of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think self-expression is a really great form of self-care. And that's what our next session is actually about. We're talking about art and writing and, you know, whether you consider yourself an artist or a writer, you know, anyone can practice those things. And, and it's all a matter of how you look at what you're doing and look at it non-judgmentally. And just be able to get those feelings and those emotions out, whether it's in the drums or whether it's writing on paper or whether it's, you know, painting a watercolor of a tree, you know, it's, it's all about how you express it and what you're putting into it. So mm -hmm. I thought that was a really beautiful comment. Um, I saw another kind of statement here that they only gave gifts on the last day of their job and that would be another way to do it if you know there's like if it's a, a certain period of time and also just be very aware that the gifts are not expected you know as a when a professional's in the house they don't expect gifts um, sometimes people are um, have the same caregiver for years and that's when those relationships kind of evolve into they're basically a family member and, and that's fine, that's beautiful. Remember and respect boundaries. And when, if the caregiver forgets, then gently remind them. When you forget, you know, gently remind yourself that there are boundaries, they have their own family and life. And, um, and it cuts down on the come over when it's not your shift kind of you know, request and it cuts down on them expecting things from you as well. So it's 11.30, I'm sure you have to move on. 
Yeah, no, this has been a really great time, Margaret. I really appreciate you being here and giving us some insight into um, the perspective of a professional caregiver, you know, whether somebody is joining us who is an in-home professional caregiver or, you know, we have family caregivers here who hire caregivers to help care for their loved one and give them some sort of respite. So it's really important to have that perspective and understand, you know, what boundaries you should set. Um, so I really appreciate that. This has been super insightful. Thank you.